It's mid-morning in Marseille. Near the city's port, two vehicles are on fire. A trapped armoured vehicle can be seen through the smoke. A dozen men held up the van and blew off its door using explosives. The gang are transferring sackloads of banknotes to a powerful Audi station wagon. They have machine guns and wear bulletproof vests. Within a few moments, the police arrive. And there's a shootout. The bullets fly just a few feet off the ground amidst the morning traffic. It's open warfare in the city center. I saw this guy in a balaclava all in black and with a Kalashnikov shooting at everyone. Then a, a bullet hit my car windscreen and everything went white. That's when I left the car, engine still running, and I got out and sheltered behind it. But the bullets kept whistling overhead. The driver miraculously survived unscathed. His windscreen, like that of the armored car, riddled with bullets. This is a dangerous gang of madmen. They shot off dozens of rounds at the security guards, the police, and bystanders. Bullet casings lie scattered all over the ground. The intense violence in broad daylight shocked police and investigators. This is obviously a well-organized gang. They know about explosives, stolen vehicles, automatic weapons, and aren't afraid of murdering people. They were shooting to kill. Luckily, no one was killed or even injured. The criminals make off with two million euros. Determined, heavily armed and well organized, a commando style operation, which is becoming the norm in serious crime. For the first time, members of this new generation of criminals have allowed cameras to follow them around. And they explain how the bosses of the housing estates have made it to the top of the heap of organized crime. It's 11 o'clock at night in an isolated parking lot in a suburb north of Paris. The young man we're meeting steals cars for a living, converts them and sells them to criminals and drug lords. He's known as the Fox. It's like a uniform. From 11 each night, we cover our heads. And if you take it off, it means you've given up. It's not very discreet, though. What's not discreet is what we're driving in. The car is an Audi station wagon, similar to the type used in Marseille. The RS6 is a 600 horsepower monster, favored by the crime world. Obviously, it's stolen. The driver, Fox, is from the suburb of Val d'Oise, north of Paris. He became a petty thief while still a teenager. His passion for cars led him to specialize in the theft of large, powerful vehicles over the past 10 years. Tonight, his hunting ground is in a posh suburb to the west of the capital. His targets are high-powered sports cars for drug traffickers heading to Spain or Holland. We cruise, drive about, we scavenge, a bit like dogs around refuse. That's what we are, I suppose. Look, there's a station wagon there. Two liters. That's clean. After a quarter of an hour, they've spotted their first target, a German station wagon much sought after by drug dealers. Is it 2.5 liters or two liters? Two liters. That's ah, not crap. That won't work. The model's no good. It's not powerful enough. So you're figuring out your deal? Well, that's what we're trying to do. So far, nothing. But there's a Mini. The thief spotted a high-end Mini Sports, a small racer that can do 250 kilometers an hour and is very popular these days with the crooks on the estates. That's more like it. Now, it's worth it since it costs 30,000 euros. 
And that's not just any car, that. Oh, look, there's a light on, on the right. Better make sure there's no one sleeping inside. Fox has found his prey. After a good look around, we head off to a quiet spot. Okay, this is good. This is safe. His secret to sealing any car, no matter the make, is an electrical device made in Russia. The high-tech toy can start any vehicle by logging on to its onboard computer. Look here, you see, you got Alphas. We can get those. There's Aston Martin, Cadillac, Chevrolet, Chrysler, Citroën, Dacia. It's all happening here. There are all sorts of cars here, all the best models. Anything that moves, we can take. Everything, anything that's worth some money, we can start it. They have a machine like this in the garages, but it weighs more than 150 kilos. This portable device is extremely rare. This is just for thieves, made specially for them. There's probably just 100 of these in the world. How much is it worth then on the black market? More than 10,000 euros. But you know, to me, 10,000 euros isn't a lot of money. One good car sale and I've made my money back. They tried to take it from us, but no way, we're going to give up. Back on the street where the Mini is parked. Oh, look, the light. That's weird. You'd better watch out. At midnight, not all the locals have gone to sleep yet, but that doesn't worry the robber. He assigns a task to one of the accomplices. Listen, uh, take the gel with you and let no one through the door here, okay? This large spray can contains a paralyzing tear gas gel, a very powerful weapon. Now, that'll calm you down a bit. As for those who are a bit too curious, Instead of hitting them, a quick spray of this will relax them. But don't turn the engine off, okay? It's very dangerous here. Come on. We follow the thief with a small night vision camera. It takes Fox about 10 seconds to open the car door using a simple screwdriver. Once inside, the thief has to attach the starter device to the onboard computer. Let's hope it works. The high-tech machine can sometimes be temperamental. Come on, start, you son of a... Start, will you? If I tell you to get out, then get out. And you better be quick. They'll figure out what's going on otherwise. They're not stupid here, you know. Oh, good. Excellent. I love you. There. So now you need the card, right? And now I put the card and do my thing. The card has replaced keys in many more recent models. Fox has a card which hasn't been programmed. Now the computer has been hacked. The card will become the only way the car can start. It's now looking for the key code. It worked. Heard the engine? You can see the tank is half full. That's ready to go. There are some defaults that light up, like the ABS system and that kind of stuff. Stuff's malfunctioning now, but I can fix that later at the garage. Okay, let's not hang about. Come on, we better get out. Fox gets out. Nothing says he won't come back later to steal it. What a pain. It's taken an hour to get going. That's too cold. That's what happens. The cold freezes the liquid crystals. Do you realize the risk you're running? 
to be honest, from the moment I get out of the car, no. I don't pay attention to what's going on around me. I just focus on the job. Taking risks has become second nature. He's been shot at in the same neighborhood by a police patrol. There's a lot of security around here. As if to prove it, at the red light, the car thief comes face to face with a patrol car. There they are, there they are. Fox is hooded and driving a powerful car. He knows he'll look suspicious, so he drives off fast. They'll follow us, just you see. And the patrol car does indeed follow. We're being hunted now. Now look, they're in front of us now as well. 200 meters further ahead, a second patrol car is blocking the street. The police have called for backup. Okay, boys, you want to play? All right, off we go then. And the chase is on. Civilians, mind out. So you don't stop when they tell you to? No. You see that? There's quite a few of them. They're trying to play a dirty trick on us by blocking off all the roads. There are several of them now. With walkie-talkies. We try to play their little game, but this is getting serious. They're all over the place. There, on the left. There, on the left, look. Look down there. Flooring the accelerator loses the patrol car that's closest. Now he needs to disappear as quickly as possible. Fox has a trick up his sleeve. They won't see us on that bend. Usually we turn off the lights. That way they won't spot us. Usually we never turn the headlights on. Otherwise we've had it, like dead ducks. We're now doing 130 kilometers an hour with no lights, all the way to the motorway. So have they stopped chasing us now? No, they're still looking for us. So we need to clear out of here. The sooner we're gone, the better. This little roundabout is nothing, but there were a lot of them. If I'd carried going straight back there, you could see the blockade they were setting up for me on the sides. Oh, they were tough. In this area, they're good. If you're not cold-blooded here, you lose control, and then you've had it. Fox drives even faster to leave the area. This is more like it. 280, that's good. We're safe now. No more hassles. Even better at 290. A few days later, Fox shows us an anonymous garage in the suburbs. He's not just a car thief. He's the boss of a thriving business that disguises and sells stolen vehicles. Where are we? Oh, this is my little paradise. It's well hidden. He's driving a Renault Megane, which was stolen the night before. We need to change the number plates if we keep it parked outside. Otherwise, the cops will spot it and take it. Uh, we'd be dead, so we need to change everything. The plates, the insurance. Where will these cars end up? Well, often it's to those who need fast cars when they're couriering drugs and stuff like that. Then there's the battering ram. Well, what's the battering ram? That's when you crash uh, the battering ram vehicle. You reverse it, break a window or something. Using a vehicle as a battering ram is, in the suburbs, one of the first things a would-be criminal learns. In March 2010, near Paris, this man repeatedly rammed his vehicle into a cash machine before fleeing with his loot. And spectacular attacks like that also take place in Paris itself. The internet is full of similar videos, usually filmed by passers-by using their mobile phones. In 2009, a record number of banks, about 50, were robbed using this method. The McGann stolen by Fox's gang will likely be used for that very purpose. A crook ordered the car specially. How much will you sell this for? Since it's for a good friend that I admire, I'll sell it for 2,000 euros. So this car would only be used once then? Well, used as a ram, it'll all be over in 30 seconds. Cars like this won't be on the road for long. In a year, he sells on about 100 cars. It's a lucrative business. You can earn good money. 45,000 or 50,000 euros a month usually? 
So you could make as much as 50,000 a month? Well, today it could be 50, uh, 75 or even 80,000 euros. Fox estimates there are about 50 gangs that do the same as his in France. The demand for stolen vehicles is high, in particular for the rapid transport of drugs to Spain or Holland. The so-called go-fast drug running technique is said to have begun in the 1990s in Lyon in southeast France. The city is still a stronghold of drug trafficking. In the police car park, there's an impressive lineup of vehicles. An Audi Coupe and four-wheel drive Mercedes, both of them seized in connection with drug smuggling. Commissioner Sebastian Moras heads up the drug squad. He shows off the haul seized from high-speed couriers on their way back from Holland. This is what we call the transport car. It was used to carry the drugs that we seized, which was 150 kilos of powder. The police officer admits it's hard catching up with a sports car like the RS4, which is a similar model to Fox's car. When we suspect a car like this, we have to take a lot of precautions if we're looking to make arrests. Obviously, turning the siren on and the flashing lights isn't going to stop this kind of vehicle. And once the chase starts, after they know the police are onto them, there's very little hope of catching up with this kind of car. Arresting this particular gang led to a record drugs haul. Sebastian Morris shows us where confiscated drugs are and stored inside this wardrobe are the drugs seized in the RS4. It's all of this. Well, how much is there? Heroin, 112 kilos. Cocaine, 55 kilos. That's 112,000 doses of heroin on the street. You definitely need a good number of clients to distribute 112,000 doses and 55,000 doses, since it's all sold by the gram. The resale value is a lot, several million for the heroin and three million for the cocaine. Four or five years ago, a kilo of coke or heroin was worth a good deal. Now it's a hundred times more, 50 times more than just five or ten years ago. The drug runners that were detained were all in their 30s and are all from the same suburb of Lyon. Most violent crime here is committed by those who are from that suburb. They started off as small-time dealers and are now calling the shots in drug trafficking. Lyon is the perfect example of how serious crime has changed. Here, drug trafficking has slowly been taken over by the young wolves that come from the housing estates and the pattern is repeating itself all over France. They now control up to 90% of drug traffic. It's how they've accumulated so much wealth. It's late afternoon on a March day in 2010 in the Trocadero Park in central Paris. We're due to meet up with a drug dealer from the suburbs. He's chosen this upmarket part of Paris, close by the Eiffel Tower, and popular with tourists. The man is on time. A cashmere coat, a designer label suit, and expensive shoes. The boy from the suburbs is not hiding his success. We'll call him Stefan. For the past six years, he's led a team that has focused on high-speed drug running. He offers to take us along on their next trip to Holland to stock up on hashish and cocaine. We're looking to pick up between two and five kilos of cocaine and 200 kilos of the best quality hashish we can get. We'll meet here in Paris. I'll pick you up. You'll need to be equipped, and I don't have the time to take care of that. All you need is a pair of gloves and a hood. Don't wear the hood, just keep it in your pocket. You'll only need it if we have to run a barricade. Then you put it on, and we do what we need to do. And secondly, don't bring a phone or tell anyone where you're going, unless you want someone waiting for you when you return. The trafficker doesn't deny the trip is not without its serious risks. A confrontation with police is always a possibility. I'll provide you with bulletproof vests in case we need to smash through a barricade or if there's a problem. It's better to have that extra safeguard just in case we're stopped. Naturally, we won't be stopping to show them what's in the boot, We'll be flooring it instead. And sometimes the cops get angry and start shooting, but usually they don't. You never know, one of them might be a cowboy. 
I've never been caught, but I have been shot at. Stefan heads up to Holland several times a month and promises to call us before his next trip. But we'll have to wait a long time before he phones. September, six months after our first meeting at the Trocadero Park. The drug dealer is wary and decided not to call several times. Finally, we fix a rendezvous in the suburbs. It's 10 at night and the journey will happen overnight. There are two cars. Behind the wheel of the powerful four-wheel drive is Stefan. Okay. Yeah, and you? Ready then? Let's go. We're going to take the motorway. Destination, Hollanda. It's 10.30 p.m., a 400-kilometer journey. Belgium and two border crossings lie ahead. The same coming back with the added proviso of being back in the French capital before sunup. Up ahead, two accomplices are in the other car. Their job is to look for police or customs officials that are checking vehicles and warn Stefan to change his route. They are the pathfinders that open up the way ahead. On the way up there, we may not have the merchandise, but we've got all the cash. No cash, no merchandise. And we're in a stolen vehicle. Usually, though, the outward journey is quite safe. Well, how about the car in front? Is that stolen? No, the car up ahead is fine. There's nothing illegal about it. We'll tell them to stay well ahead because a pathfinder that's just 50 meters in front isn't much use. Stefan uses cell phones, specially purchased for the trip, to keep in touch with the car in front. Drive, but not too fast. Do about, I don't know, 150, 160, no more. Any problems, let me know. If there are no problems, don't call. Only contact me if there's a problem. Okay, see you soon. Let's go. The drug smuggler is taking a big risk. In the boot, he has 600,000 euros in cash. At an average speed of 150 kilometers an hour and without stopping, the drive to Holland takes two and a half hours. By one in the morning, we arrive at our destination, Breda, a medium-sized town some 10 kilometers from the Belgian border. The supplier is based here. When he arrives, Stefan calls his accomplice. Hello? Hello? You already here? Tell him I'll be there in a minute. Don't tell him we have someone with us or what we're doing, otherwise he'll freak out, so keep quiet. I'm dropping him off and then we'll pick him up on the way back, so don't worry. See you shortly. You see, the Dutch people with whom I do business won't be thrilled if I take along someone who's filming everything. They won't appreciate it, and they certainly won't understand it. As I said, they'll freak, probably. When I've done my shopping and have the merchandise, I'll pick you up again and we'll take off. Okay, see you later. So there's no chance of filming Stefan with his Dutch supplier. We hang out patiently in the center of Breda while he does his deal. The drug trafficker drives up two hours later. Let's drive for a bit. I don't want to hang about in the middle of town. I've got 150 kilos of hashish and nine kilos of coke. Can we take a look? Yeah, look, there yeah, on the back seat. That's the nine kilos of coke. I'll show you the hash later. We'll stop and you can have a quick look. Amazingly, the drug hasn't been hidden. The nine kilos of cocaine are in a bag just an arm's length away. The coke always stays on the rear seat. That way, if there's a problem and I have to ditch the car, I'll grab the bag. I'm not leaving that. I can afford to lose the car on the hash, but if there's a chance to get away on foot, I'll at least try and save the coke. Oh, 
So that's several kilos? No, that was one kilo, and there are nine like it in the bag. So how much did it cost? Well, like that? That cost 30,000 each. The cost, therefore, was 270,000 euros for nine kilos, plus another 300,000 for the 150 kilos of hashish in the boot. Once we've left town, he stops, as he said he would. Come on then, quick, I'll show it to you. Is that what they call a Moroccan bag? Exactly. So how much is inside in each package? 30 kilos. They're well wrapped, but it's a real pain in the ass to open them up. Especially if you're in a hurry. Well, here's two of them anyway. You see, each pack has 100 grams. There are five bundles, so it's 150 kilos altogether. But I'm not going to open up the coke, otherwise it'll scatter everywhere. Each gram is expensive nowadays. By now, it's 3.30 a.m. and time to get going. There's no time to waste, as it will be light in three hours, and the border needs to be crossed without drawing attention to us. The trip back is at 160 and stays at 160. Cruise control. No point attracting attention. And there's no point driving at 240 like idiots. No point whatsoever. But the only reason to have a powerful car like this, if there's a problem, only if there's a problem. While everything's fine, there's no point risking it. While there are no flashing blue lights approaching. We cross through Belgium again in less than an hour. At 4.30 a.m., the first hurdle, customs at the French border. Right now, I'm calling the lead car to make sure they made it through okay. Hello? Are you through the barrier? Okay, good. Well, I'm just coming up to it. This is customs. Here it is. But there's nobody at the post, and we don't even slow down. Since the 1995 Schengen Agreement, there are no longer border controls between most EU members. Mobile phones have also helped high-speed drug smuggling. Former small-time crooks like Stefan have now flourished on a far bigger stage. So we're in France. That's it, right? The next? Well, the next problem is the toll booth. The first toll booth in France is 40 kilometers from the border. Any stop makes the drug dealers nervous, and the police and mobile customs units often stage impromptu checks here. The lead car should let them know if that's the case this evening. So if the phone rings, it's bad news? Well, if it rings, it means that there are problems at the toll booths, and we'll need to get off the motorway, use some of the local roads, and then get back on further up. But let's see what happens first. To set his mind at ease, the trafficker phones the car in front. Hello? So, did you get through? All quiet? Good. Okay. I'm speeding up to make sure we get there as soon as possible, just in case the customs police decide to show up. There's always a chance the police car will arrive 30 seconds after the lead car has gone through and start checking vehicles. So let's rock and roll. This is the toll booth. And there are no uniforms in sight. It's now 5 a.m. and there's another 200 kilometers to go. The trafficker will be home just before sunup. We've done the hardest part. Stefan is confident there's little chance of being stopped on this last stretch of the journey. His drugs run has worked and he'll make huge profits. So there's 150 kilos of hash, nine kilos of coke, 
You've invested 600,000 euros. How much profit do you think you'll make? I'd say about 145,000 euros. And you share that between the two of you? Yeah, two of us. Usually we make between two and four trips a month. On average, three a month, say. So you can work it out. 150,000 euros profit each trip. So that means 450,000 euros profit a month. Over 100 trips, Stefan's only had to abandon his car and merchandise four times to avoid the police. The go-fast drug smuggling has allowed him to build a fortune of several million in just a few years. The boys from the poor housing estates have also become expert in the holy grail of hold-ups, the armoured cars. We tracked down the pioneer of the spectacular form of hold-up. His name is Redouin Faid. He served 10 years in prison for an attack on a van transporting funds here in Villepinte, a Paris suburb. He was 24 years old at the time. When I decided to attack the armored vans, I was already an experienced thief. I was ambitious. I wanted to go up in the criminal world. And attacking the vans, transporting money, it seemed the next step. Why? Because when you attack an armored van, it's as good as, as it gets. That's where the most money can be made. It's a great hold-up, isn't it? In the July evening in 1997, Redouin and his gang was lying in ambush near this crossroads. They were waiting for a van that's finishing its rounds. On board are 50 million francs, the equivalent of 8 million euros. The van pulled up at the red light down there. Then it turned left, like that small truck you're watching here, and then uh, headed off in that direction over there. At that time of day, the roads in this industrial estate were deserted. The van slowed down before turning left and heading for its depot. Suddenly, a car rushed forward. I smashed into his front left wheel and the wheel buckled. A Peugeot expert came and parked in front. The truck that was behind stopped in front as well. We all got out and got in front of the windscreen. We attached a strip of plastic explosive on the windscreen. The criminals were hooded and armed with Kalashnikovs. With the additional threat of explosives on the windscreen, the security guards quickly decide to surrender. The side door open up is about here. I pulled out one guard and I put him down and I took out a second guard and put him down too. When he opened up the safe, it was full of sacks. It was like Ali Baba's cave. When I saw the sacks and I was holding my gun like this and I told myself, there's too many sacks here. You see, the mistake we made, even though the hold-up was well organized, the mistake was we'd underestimated the transfer of all that money. The fact is that after four minutes, we were still there with all the bags trying to empty it all. Four minutes is too long. The local police station was just 250 meters away, and the alarm was raised. The police now confronted Redouin and his cronies. The crime squad arrived, and there was an exchange of shots. I remember I was, I was about here. The van was on this side. And I was hit here, a bullet hit me. And then I fell to the ground. But my survival instinct, my animal instinct, told me to get up. I wasn't even holding my arm. I got up and headed off towards the car. There was someone with me who shot at the police with the Kalashnikov, but he didn't kill anyone. They returned fire. It was pretty heavy. We got in the cars put the bags in the boot, and off we went. The criminal is not seriously injured. He and his accomplices disappear with several million euros worth of banknotes, which will never be recovered. But the blood from his wound identifies Redouin Faid. After a year in hiding, the crook is arrested. In all, he is charged with a hold-up and robbery of six armoured vehicles. Redouin Faid today says he's a changed man. He works as a sales manager in Paris, a long way from his housing estate. He spent his youth growing up in a subsidized high rise and turned to crime. Thefts, break ins, and eventually armed robbery by the time he was 18. How did this lout from the suburbs make the great leap from petty to serious crime? 
Well, typically, small-time crooks on, on the estates find it difficult to get out of a bad situation. Because just by looking at them, people don't want to work with them. We dress the same in tracksuits and hoods and Nike Air Maxes, we eat kebabs and we drink Coke Zero. I mean, what is that? But organized crime has always been suspicious of these kinds of delinquents, and that's what's allowed these delinquents to progress in serious crime. Why? Because the police are keeping watch on the big-time crooks. They don't bother with the youngsters from the suburbs. A flood of cheap weapons from the wars in the former Yugoslavia has meant the boys from the suburbs can play in the big boys league. Drug dealers were able to get kitted out. There was no one to bother them, so they grew in strength. The hold-up men had unlimited ambition. And by climbing up, like we did, on the armoured vans, in the style of Michael Mann, like in Heat. Michael Mann is a Hollywood film director and the idol of Redouin Faid. He learnt about holding up the money vans by watching one of his films, Heat, starring Robert De Niro and Val Kilmer. It was February 1996, we went to see Heat, like anybody else. It was about serious big-time crime, and we sat down with our popcorn and we watched it. I was stunned. Like the earth stopped spinning. It was like being smacked. I mean, we'd seen lots of films, but we all agreed about this one. So that's when we decided to rob vans carrying money. You see, I was fascinated by the small details to make each robbery as smooth and perfect as possible. Val Kilmer will open the door, Robert De Niro will go inside to get the guards out, and then there's Tom Sizemore grabs the money. All those little details interested us about how to get inside an armoured van. It gave us the courage and the will to do it. We said, OK, we know how to do this now. Redouin and his friends will watch the film seven times in all to analyse each scene. Hollywood is a mine of information for these youngsters from the estates. They even disguise themselves the same way as the criminals in the films that inspired them. What we did, like in a previous hold-up we'd staged in a bank once, when we had these masks of politicians like in Point Break, the film with Patrick Swayze, well, we decided we'd wear hockey masks while holding up the armoured van. We'd do it the Michael Mann way. And that's what happened. Redouin Faid is a perfect example of the generation of gangsters inspired by Hollywood. He grew up in the suburb of Kay, and there lies the key to his story. He, however, is still banned from this Paris suburb. 60 kilometers north of Paris, in the agricultural area of the Oise region, Kay has 35,000 inhabitants. Half the population lives in the plateau subsidized housing estates built in the 1960s. Redouin Faid was raised on the Guinemer estate, where he's still known, and the bandit has entered local folklore. Oh, they were? Yeah, I've heard of him. Great guy. The best. Redouin Faid's career in organized crime is something some youngsters here dream about. 40% of those that live in the plateau are unemployed. Serious crime is rare, but small operators openly sell hashish and cocaine outside the apartment blocks. It's pure CC. As on every afternoon, several dozen youngsters have gathered here. In the entrances, the dealers make no attempt to hide their business deals. The visible part of the drug trade are these street dealers. They are the last link in the drug network chain. Who heads up the networks? Police blame organized crime. But after several days spent in the plateau, we meet 35-year-old Karim. He started as a dealer on the streets when he was a teenager, before slowly working his way up through the ranks. We meet in an anonymous stairwell. I'm the guy who provides all the housing blocks and estates in Crail. The bag man. The packet man. I can provide it by the kilo too for those who want to sell that much or more. I'm a semi-wholesaler, I suppose. Karim says he makes 300 euros per kilo of cannabis. By getting through 100 kilos a month, his income is 30,000 euros. 
There are 10 or so bigger dealers like him in the town. Kareem has been the boss of a well-organized gang for 10 years. In our group, we have people that act as lookouts, people that work for us. We have guys who keep an eye on the police. We have the financial means, we have the technical means, we have the vehicles, and most of all, we have the people. 150,000 foot soldiers. For a bit of cash, they'll do just about anything. The stakes are indeed high. The drugs business generates millions of euros. But aren't people envious of you? Isn't this a dangerous profession? It is a dangerous profession, but everything is dangerous. There's nothing that's not dangerous, but we know how to take care of that. There are some shows of force. When it gets too dangerous, it's time to bring out the artillery. Small handguns for the housing estate, something bigger, in case we need to mount a punitive expedition. And what's that? This? This is an Uzi. It's Israeli. It's an automatic weapon with a 30-round magazine. It's a nice little toy. It's very easy to handle. Almost shoots itself. And for the housing estates, it's perfect. Obligatory, really. It's like safety shoes you have to wear in a factory. Same thing. Weapons of war have become the indispensable tool for the drug traffickers. In Cray, machine guns are being used for the first time to settle scores. And it's happening all over France. Among the criminals, there are now weapons specialists in much the same manner as drugs and stolen vehicles. In the greater Paris region, one crime lord is about to make a large delivery of weapons, and we meet up near the city's ring road. Bonjour. Hello, mon ami. Ça va bien? On y va? The gunrunner is from the suburbs and has served time in prison. His first crimes were small scaled armed hold ups before turning to weapons. He's cautious and insists we wear gloves inside the vehicle that's been stolen. He also disguises his voice to avoid being identified. Those who know him call him PSG. This is the ring road, and then we'll head out of Paris and then out of the suburbs too. We're going to a very quiet place indeed. It's where we hide our stuff and where we try it out. We head out of town on the motorway, leading south. We cover about 20 kilometers until we're in woodland, in the open countryside. This is like our fallback position. It's the right place these days to conduct business. It's far more discreet and much quieter too. Not somewhere you'll meet the serious crime squad. Okay, slow down a bit. Slow down, slow down. Stop, stop over there on the side. Good, excellent. Now we're going to go to the van at the back. He's keen to cover his tracks and arrange for a second vehicle, a nondescript van with another driver. And there's no way he'll let us see where we're actually going. You're okay there? Okay. We'll be driving for a little now, 15, maybe 20 kilometers. Then it's good. I'm closing you in now. See you shortly. We spend 20 minutes shut up in the back of the van. PSG hides his arsenal in the undergrowth and he's with an accomplice to pick up the consignment of weapons that has been ordered by some drug traffickers. We're digging up the goods out here because in the suburbs there are too many caretakers, too many spies, so I don't trust it. We had a lot of problems with some lockups we used to have. The stuff's in the rubbish bins down here.
So, what have you got there? Well, this is a suburban special, a Kalashnikov. It's very popular. It's much valued and quite easy to obtain. So, how much would a Kalashnikov cost? Well, one like this would sell for two and a half thousand euros. And you make a profit? Uh, how much does it cost you? Well, the guy who sells it to me for between 500 and 800 euros. Okay, let's make sure there are no bullets. Perfect. Safety is on. Okay, excellent. The arms dealer has plenty of other weapons. He unearths the Czech-made CZ 9mm automatic pistol, which he sells for 1,300 euros each. Now, this is a really nice gun. It's in demand. There's no bullet in the barrel. You shoot. It's a powerful weapon. All the drug guys want one, and they sell like hotcakes. I've got two left, and those will sell soon. I had ten of them. Got them last week, and they sold like hotcakes. You see, this is a bulletproof vest. There's even a bulletproof vest with evidence of its previous owner. This model is highly valued by armed robbers. The cost is 800 euros a piece. There's still more buried treasure, but as it's night, the dealer suggests we return the following week. And seven days later, we're back in the undergrowth. PSG and his business partner are after the Kalashnikovs they buried under a thin layer of dirt. Where does he get all these weapons? A small timer from the suburbs has become one of the region's leading arms dealers. How? You see, before I used to steal, so obviously I needed a weapon. Some people I knew put me in touch with a great guy from Eastern Europe. He used to bring in small stuff and Kalashnikovs. And then one day he had a rocket launcher. I realized he was a big time dealer. Now I've converted myself to this business. The weapons are all from countries that made up the former Yugoslavia. Like a good salesman, PSG wants to convince us that his weapons are quality goods. Here, let's test this one. All the bullets are clean. Don't, don't leave your fingerprints on them or your DNA. You never know where this might end up, damn it. Aren't you worried about using a weapon like this out here? No, oh, we'll, we'll shoot over in that direction. They're just a few boars that use this path. There's no risk. Come on, then. It really works well. It's excellent. Very nice weapon, that. Yeah. Okay, let me pick that one up. You see, now this one is a, it's a Luger. It's an American model. The same, 9mm. Works really well, like this, and you load. Perfect. Fine, that's all there is. There you are, good. Gangsters often aren't just satisfied with firearms. Robbing banks calls for explosives. The arms dealer has a sports bag, and inside is a few samples of what he has for sale. Let's see, what can I show you that's nice? Hang on, here's something special for you. That's plastic. It's C4. It's also called Semtex. This C4 explosive, this one's from Russia. You need a detonator to make it explode. It needs to be well wrapped up because it's very delicate. Now, how many grams in a loaf that big? Oh, here is about 400 grams at least. So what can 400 grams do? Well, actually, 400 grams is dangerous. It's a lot. It's too powerful. 50 grams is enough to blow the armored door off a cash machine. There's enough for four here, I can guarantee you that. 
Each kilo is worth 1,300 euros to the dealer, and he has seven kilos in his bag, as well as detonators, all of it from the Balkans. This is very dangerous too. A detonator can go off all by itself. The army has plenty of problems with fingers being blown off all the time. It's very sensitive. You need to handle it carefully, see? Here's a detonator and there's the fuse. You light it and as this is a 10 second fuse, you've got 10 seconds. For a remotely controlled explosion, PSG also sells electric detonators that are battery powered. To show us, he's put 50 grams of plastic on a manhole cover. We've put the charge here and attached it with sticky tape. The detonator goes here, the one I showed you with the two wires. So uh, let's get back now. Come on, let's get back. So what do the guys do then? You see, they place the explosive down there, say it's a cash machine. One sets up the detonator, and the other guy runs the wires out. And then this is what will happen. The first attempt fails. The humidity from the rain has affected the electrical contact. PSG sends one of his men to set off the charge. The blast sends our camera flying. Here it is again in slow motion. Good. Let's see what it did. So, the manhole cover, where'd it get to? Okay. Oh, there you go. Look, it's made a hole with a perfect right angle. It's right in the middle, like a laser. The cast iron cover has been cut open with precision. 50 grams of plastic was all it took to perforate the same depth of steel used on armoured money transporters. Aren't you worried about selling explosives? Do, I mean, do these people take some sort of precautions when civilians get killed? What do you think of it? Listen, that's their lookout. I just sell the stuff to them, OK? What happens next is their business. They're not psychopaths. They haven't killed or injured anyone. But what if terrorists get hold of this? Nah, we don't sell to terrorists. If some guy shows up and wants some plastic to blow up an underground train, I'll tell him to F off. Well, he might not tell you what it's for. Listen, we're not stupid. Someone who comes up and asks for four or five kilos right away has never happened. You can spot them a mile off. We're not crazy either. I don't fancy being chased by every police force there is. Selling weapons and explosives brings in between 10 and 15,000 euros a month. Money is the incentive that drives this new breed of crime lord. What kind of life do they lead when they're not working? What do they spend their money on? It's not possible, of course, to visit their homes or meet their families. Fox, the car dealer, agrees to be filmed in one of the rare moments he's relaxing. It's in a games arcade. And once more, he's holding a steering wheel. We're not honest people. We risk prison every night. But I hope to be able to give my kids a good life. They won't do what I do. That's why I work so hard. Why I'm 100% committed to what I do. Fox is married and, at age 28, has two children. I have a family like anybody else. My wife's at home waiting for me but she doesn't get much chance to cook for me as I'm rarely home at mealtimes. She knows not to ask questions because she loves me and I've asked her not to. When they're not working, these crime bosses from the housing estates live like anyone else. They're not marginalized like hooligans used to be. PSG, the arms dealer, is also married with children. Each Sunday morning, he shops at the market because he likes cooking for the family. <laughs> You see, I'm like Joe Blow, like anyone else. I pick up my kids from school. I drop off my kids at school. I prepare their snacks for them, their food. I've been married a few years now. The new generation keeps a low profile. They don't flaunt their wealth 
They don't drive fancy cars. They want to blend in with the masses. We're careful. I don't buy wonderful watches. I don't really buy clothes. I save everything up. But I do like nice holidays. But how do you live then? How do you launder your money? I can't tell you everything. Some people own snack bars or sandwich shops. Some are in car rentals, some own garages. Others buy up property abroad. PSG and Fox prefer to tuck their money away for the future, for their children and their retirement. Well, frankly, it's an awful life. But I like my life. I couldn't do anything else anyway. I'm scared the whole time. But what are you scared of? Of dying in a stupid way, of stray bullets, or someone wanting to settle a score. Fox has not been shot by a stray bullet, but since we spoke with him, he's been arrested for aggravated robbery. He could face 10 years in prison. Redouin Faid, one of the first armoured van specialists, is once again on the run. He's suspected of planning a hold-up in a northwest suburb of Paris that left one policeman dead in May 2010. Drug smuggler Stefan still makes his high-speed runs to Holland and back, but is hoping to retire soon. With the money he's put aside, he wants to set up in the luxury hotel business. As for the weapons dealer, he's not about to stop working. He struck gold through his contacts in the former Yugoslavia, and the demand for large caliber weapons and explosives has never been higher. In 2010, at least one person a week was dying as criminals settled scores in the housing projects around Paris. <laughs> 